The book of Nehemiah, chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachilia, and it came to pass in the month Cheshua, in the twelfth year, as I was in Shinshan, the palace. This area is in the area of present day Iran. Shinshan is about uh, December 12th, uh, 20th year. It is the 20th year of the captivity. Yeah, man, 20th year. That wouldn't be the. They were there. I know what that 20th year is. If I was in Shinshan, the powers, again, that would be Iran. That's uh, the Babylonian captivity. He's in the land of Babylon. Ezra and everybody else has gone back. Nehemiah is still in the providence. He hasn't been in the land yet. He didn't leave. He didn't, hasn't gone. Then Hanani, one of my brethren, Jewish, came, and he and certain men of Judah, Jewish, so one of my brethren in saying certain men of Judah, Hananiah would probably maybe be a relative of Nehemiah. My brethren. And then he says certain men of Judah. Well, what's important about that statement? Well, when you read the life of Jesus Christ and you're a Roman Catholic, and when it says my brethren, well, that was a Jewish. You know, they all said they were my brethren. But when the people say, you know, that mother and your brethren are here, your sisters, it's a lot more closely related to the fact is you're talking about relatives when you've got, you know, the men of Judah here. They're Jewish and they're close brethren. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped. Ezra and all the people that we read about, I think it was Ezra chapter 2 or 3, the genealogy chapter 2 or chapter 3. What happened to them? How did they do? How much did they get done? Which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. All right, so the people that are left, he's got a concern. He wants to know how did they do? Did everything work out the way they wanted to do? And they said unto me, The raiment that are left of the captivity, they there in the providence are in a great affliction and reproach. There's a problem. What's the problem? Now here's the subject of the book of Nehemiah. The temple's built. Hallelujah. The central form of the Jewish Worship is a building, not the church. Now here's the main part of Nehemiah. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. The city is not built. The walls later on we're going to learn are in total chaos if they're there. So in other words, Babylon did God a wonderful job of destroying the city. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Let's see what he prays. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, God, who's in charge of all the heavens, there's no other. The great and terrible God. All right, he's great. Now, that terrible doesn't mean that he's wicked. If you were a Jewish person and you read Acts, I mean, not Acts, if you read Exodus, and all the stuff he did for the people of Israel to get out of the land, to get out of Egypt, that was terrible. And that terrible means wonderful. A God that imposes terror. If you can think about what God and his tornado can do in Tornado Alley. 
and you have no fear of God in Tornado Alley, that you can't go to church, you can't worship the God of the Bible, the God of all forces, you are a fool. You say, why do you pick a tornado? What? That's the first thing that came to mind. Tornadoes is one of those events that it can pick up a house and leave next door all completely alone. It can take your neighbor's land and put it in your yard and keep your house okay. It can do everything that happened in the book of Job. It can destroy everything you have and take lives. But yet, there's no fear in America. So that terrible God is not mean a wicked God. I mean, this is a God that can do things. He is, I hate to use the word, because they use it today. He's an awesome God of powers. What he can do and what he can't do is amazing. That keep his covenant... Everything that God says he will do, he's going to do. All dogs do not go to heaven because God said animals don't go to heaven. Don't change God's word. If Uncle Eric has not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ as his Savior, he will not end up at the end judgment and everything worked out and weighed out and spend some time in purgatory and go to heaven. That's not what God said. God said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. God has said, despite the religions and, and teachings and everything going on in the world today, that he loves and still has his eye on the Jew. He is not done with Israel. They are set aside, but he will have arraignment and he will create in them a new heart. He will give them the new earth. He will take care of them, no matter what you want to think. God will not ever lie. If you have a specific promise in this word, given to you, rightly dividing the scriptures, if Jesus said, I will never leave thee or forsake thee, and you say, well, God can do his own thing, you, you are the liar, let every man be... Uh, you know, a liar. And God be true. If the Bible says that you can know where you're going to go when you die, you turn around and say, oh, I can't know. You are the liar. Keep on going. And mercy for them that love him. Mercy. Satan does not show mercy. Mother Nature can't show nurse mercy because she's no such thing. And if you think man can show you mercy, try showing up to the doctors with a health care program that Obama wants you to have and have no money to pay for the copay. You see how merciful that doctor is. You'll find one in a hundred that will be. You think man is merciful? What about the guillotine? What about the nuclear bomb? What about a tank? What about missiles? What about Haman and his guillotine? What about Cain with his brother? Man is not merciful outside the nature of God. That love him and observe his commandments. Again, you're under the you're under the law here still. They, they have to obey the law of Moses. Now notice Nehemiah doesn't start his prayer out with, give me. He proclaims who God is. We're so great in our prayer life today, you know, it's give me, give me, give me. Let thy ear now be attended, and thy eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night for the children of Israel, thy servants. And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. He's praying for the nation of Israel. He is confessing the sins of Israel. 
He's repenting for the nation of Israel. He's not praying for the land. It's amazing how you get these people, we're going to have revival. Let's pray for a revival. And they don't go out and tell people about Jesus Christ. They don't repent of the sin. They don't get right. We have dwelt very corruptly. He's confessing. In verse 6, he was inter interceding intercession for the people. Now he's confessing against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. The commandments, those are the ten, thou shalt not. The statutes, you know, if you see the guy that you don't like, his, his, his donkey falls down and you just walk on by, ha, 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 ha. The judgments, the fatherless boy comes up or the widow comes up and she's have done, she has somebody do her wrong and because the guy is rich and you, you know, take his side. He's a big ball player, and so you, you pronounce him innocent and, you know, a lousy little stinking security guard over a, a colored guy and wait to find out what the verdict will that be. If you were to confess a sin in America, you confess the injustice. That America has. You know, that statue of justice is supposed to be blindfolded. I can't tell, but that blindfolded justice looks like to me that her top is uncovered. That reveals the real great sin and godness of America. Injustice and sexuality and in entertainment. As we watch the trial in from our bedroom and from our living room television set. Because we ain't got a life. I really don't care about Zimmerman or whoever. I'm sorry. If he's guilty, pronounce him guilty. If he's innocent, pronounce him innocent. Get a life. This uh, massacre that happened in uh, Colorado, the movie theater. Well, I prayed for the families that happened, but that will be the next one on the television. But our justice system is so corrupt. The guy admitted he did it, but there's still going to be a trial because he's insane. No, he's not. It's a proven thing that everything he did, he wasn't insane. But you just want to waste taxpayers' money and try to get somebody off who doesn't need to be off. And this is the same condition that Israel was doing. People who should have been guilty were not being guilty eyes, or whatever you want to call it. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you aboard among the nations. So why are they in Babylon? The law told them. The prophets, before they went into captivity, told them. The prophets at the captivity told them. The prophets, while they're in the captivity, told them. And who listened? Evidently nobody, because where they end up? In Babylon. Doesn't the fact is, reading the Jewish history, history that the church is not going to right, get right when God says it's not going to get right? In the last day, the last day you see in church age, the Bible says it's not going to be right, and but you turn around and pray, Lord, make the church right. Uh, church, Christians, pastor, deacon, you need to get hooked on phonics and learn how to read again. But, now this is a good but. There are some buts in the Bible, B-U-T, that are excellent. 
Some of the buts in the Bible are merciful and gracious buts. There are some buts that are absolutely horrible. But if ye turn unto me, that's God. Nehemiah is quoting God from the law. I'll tell you right now, if you want a prayer answer, if you're really serious in your life, you need to memorize scripture. And you need to say, and you better quote it right. <laughs> God, your word says this. If you're in a time in your life and you really feel like, you know what, God is not with you, you have the right to go over there in Hebrews and say, Lord, this says right here that you'll never leave me and forsake me. I feel like I'm being left. Lord, according to that scripture right there, I should feel your presence and I don't. What's going on? People don't do that because you know what? They'll expect the answer from God. And what do you think the answer is going to be? You think it's going to be that God was at wrong or do you think you were at wrong? And you quote God like that in a prayer and you're serious. Like James says, if any man lack uh, understanding or wisdom, I forget which one it is, let him ask for God shall pray. But let him not, you know, okay, now you get the answer. Well, I don't want to do that. See, a lot of Christians don't do that because they don't like the answer. And God will speak down. It's because of that sin. <laughs> well, I didn't want to hear that. It's because you're not in the Bible all the time. Well, I don't want I don't have time for that. I gotta watch the Zimmerman trial. I gotta find out what's going on. Oprah's gonna have this idiot on television who thinks, you know, he can use a woman's room and being a guy. And I've got to watch The View and listen to a bunch of women who probably can't even make a pancake for their husband. But I've got to listen to them. And yet, women in the church don't do what, Jane, what uh, Titus said, uh, what the book of Titus says, what Paul wrote, that the women in the church should get together and teach each woman how to do a job. You know what's, you know what's lacking in America today with, with the housewives and the daughters? They don't know nothing. But you can carry on a gossip, a gossip session in the church, but you can't sit down and have one woman who knows how to sew help another woman learn how to sew, or that woman who can make cookies show the other woman who, don't, who doesn't know how to make cookies how to make them. A lot of women have not read Proverbs 31 and are scared to read 31. I've even heard women in the church, I don't make my husband lunch. I don't do that for him. What do you think I am? His wife. I pity the fool for being married to that woman. And I give the guy grace enough that he stays with her. They keep the commandments and do them that, that were... You know, Verse 9, but if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though that there were of you cast out unto the outermost part of the heaven. No, that's a small age. The Jews have gone as far as the Jews could know in the known world. Remember, they don't know about America. I don't think the Jew, I think he heard of people in China, because they came through caravan. But I don't think a Jew has ever been to China in this time period. And maybe what the Bible says, maybe the Jew, the far as northeast as he's gone, is Babylon. Maybe he hasn't been to Russia. When Paul goes around and meets the Jews in Europe, they're around the Mediterranean Sea area. But had any gone to England? Well, I don't know what England was called back then. But I mean the land that we call England today. Had any Jews been as far as what we call South Africa? They were supposed to stay in the land. So going to Babylon is way off place. 
be like someone today in the uh, 48 continental states, God called them out and say, listen, I want you to go into the desert, to the desert, to the jungles of Africa. Wow. I have invented this state and you want me to jump way over there. I have even traveled to the west coast of America. Never mind. You want me to go all the way there. And that's what it is to Israel. Listen, these, these Jews may not have gone to Dan. I mean the city of Dan, northern Israel. They may not have been as far as Bathsheba, southern Israel. And now they're going way over to the northeast area of the Middle East. Here they are in Babylon. And they're completely out of place. They're not in the land. And then Nehemiah gets this report by mouth, oral, because there was no cameras or anything back then. The city is in utter destruction. Right? What do you think he feels? Here he is way away. Now chapter 2, we see, we know the book of Nehemiah. We know what happens. We know what happens in chapter 2. But think about it. You never heard Nehemiah in chapter 2. We're in chapter 1. You just imagine he's just sitting there like, I'm never going to be home again. The place is destroyed. Uh, what about that place I remember going to as a kid? Or maybe me and my sweetheart, we went there. And I hear the place is destroyed. We know Nehemiah's life. He doesn't. He's living right now. He's thinking about the land is destroyed. Here we are in the, the, the foreign Gentile land where they eat pork sausages and pork, which is which is uh, illegal to us. Remember Daniel with Nebuchadnezzar? The king wanted the kids to have all this different food and stuff like that. And Daniel's like, we can't. And the servant says, well, you're going to get the king mad. You have to. And Daniel's like, well, let's, let's try a little thing here. Let's pray to the Lord. Let's live by the dietary laws of my God. And then, you know, and then God granted that prayer. See, the Jews' up world has been upside down. Now it's been upside down. Now for Nehemiah, it's... The walls are gone. Now you... I don't even want to say this. You get somebody like Nehemiah today, and you transport him over to Israel, what, what's he going to say right now? He's going to see the same thing that Nehemiah saw back in 446 B.C. You take a Jew from America, send him over right now, he will see what Nehemiah saw when he was in Babylon. All walk around, the place is destroyed. There's no walls. There's a wailing wall. At least when Nehemiah went, there was a temple. You transport a Jew over there right now, he won't find the temple. He'll find the dumb of the rock. I gather them from thence and will bring them into a place that I have chosen to set my name there. That is the mercy and grace of God for the Jew. I will bring you back. I'm your father. I'm going to whip you for what you did. I'm going to cast the rod upon you. If I expect earthly fathers to, to put the rod to their children, I, as your father, will put the rod to your behind. God is a father that corrects, punishes, and chastises. I don't care what your psychologists say to do. Back when they used the rod on the kids, and running and chewing gum in the schools was the, was the sin of the day. You didn't have kids going to school killing each other kid. Unless it was by accident. Back when you flunked school, you deserved to be flunked. And you went to summer school to regain it back. And your parents back to teachers. Now we've gone to do it man's way. And look how much of a mess we are. Babylon was a punishment to the Jew. How do you like this? 
Maybe next time when you get back in the land, I put you back in that land. Maybe you'll do what you're supposed to do. Set my name there. That's Jerusalem. And we've seen that. Now these are thy servants. Now here's the praise. And thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. He's talking about all of them in Babylon. He's talking about all of them that were in Ezra that went back. The temple's built. There's two Jews right now that want to, they're probably, you know, some were setting up ready to go. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thy ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. And the prayer of thy servants. So other people are praying. He is a servant, then he mentions servants with an S, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king. Now, Nehemiah is praying here, because it's funny, because chapter 2, he's praying, I'm going to go up to the king. And I'm going to ask something of the king. And God said, and God's saying, because we already know chapter 2. All right, that sounds good. I like that. I will do it for you, Nehemiah. I will catch you off guard. And everything you do and everything you say is going to be from me. Because I'm going to answer your prayer. I'm going to take you out of it and put me in. So you can't go over to Jerusalem and say, look what I did, folks. I mean, he's going to be able to tell the story. It's going to be chapter 2 and like, next thing you know, my neck was on the platter. I, I expected the king to be mad at me and here I am. How did that happen, God? For I was the king's cupbearer. Now it's funny because I was the king's cupbearer. So what's that tell you about the writing of the book of Nehemiah? It was done after. He's not writing as he takes a journal. He may have recorded his prayer, but the book of Nehemiah is written afterwards. See, little key words will help you out. Ezra built the temple. That's the first restoration. Nehemiah will go and build the city walls. You saw this happen in the second restoration. 1918, World War One. God prepared the land. Ezra. The people said, business is good in Germany. We getting all the money. Hey, thank you very much. Rothschild and all that. They almost, and then the economy went down. And people were losing their jobs. And they had a socialist in power. And in 1948, God prepared the people to be back in the land. Out of Hitler. Now, I'm not saying you can throw this in the garbage can, but maybe God will give us that socialist ruler to send the Jews back home. That's the, that's the next real sin America needs to do, you know. She's committed them all already. She just hasn't gone against Israel officially. I know we I know they have, but this is not official. Enough to upset, you know, the world. But that's the book of Nehemiah as we go into, we're studying. There'll be a lot of great things.